Okay, welcome. So, how's everybody doing? Thanks for coming out to uh, listen to this great documentary. Really looking forward to it, John. A couple of uh, administrative notes. Uh, let's switch off cell phones. Uh, say hello to our one off-islander today, Mary Ellen Sullivan Shakoy, coming all the way from New Bedford to listen to you, John. So, good to have you here. Uh, Molly must be here. I, Molly, just uh, seeing as we're on camera, I just from the entire committee, just congratulations to you on One Book, One Island. Absolutely fantastic series, and uh, it's just a great pleasure to be part of this. So congratulations, Molly. Uh, so uh, again, a reminder to two speakers who were supposed to come this evening, could not make it, Christine uh, Keneally. Uh, she doesn't drive, and she's down in Quinnipiac, and Amtrak wasn't running for some reason, maybe because of the snow. And Catherine uh, uh, couldn't make it either. But we're both we're, they're both looking forward to coming to the island. We're going to reschedule it. And uh, Molly, uh, we'll leave it to you to figure out when and where. So one book, one island will continue. Uh, uh, Christine Keneally did send me over this, though, and uh, these are available. She sent uh, they're $10 each. Um, she sent me over a, a bunch of them, and uh, if you'd like to uh, take one, uh, we're going to have them set up over here uh, for you to look through, and uh, you can walk home with one if you'd like. Uh, I want to thank Petticoat Row Bakery. There's some terrific nibblies of Susu here. Uh, thanks, Susu, for bringing those by. Um, so on, jo okay, now to John. Okay, now here's my great moment to talk about John. So I've just been so impressed with the documentary work. I've looked at many of your videos on Vimeo, John, and looking forward to seeing what you've come up with here. And we're going to look at about a 22 or 20 minute document, a brief. 20 minutes and a 10 minute Two pieces today. And uh, this will be larger. This will be part of a larger program that you're working on. Uh, there's also another documentary that uh, John and I are conspiring to work on, and it's a, a documentary called Rights and Race. And that's going to be working. Uh, uh, that's going to roll out in about two years or so. So we're looking forward to that coming online, uh, in addition to a similarly themed exhibit at Hadwin House that we'll be working on with the Athenaeum and also. Um, our partners at the African American Meeting House. So looking forward to that uh, uh, very much. So John, um, what you're going to get from the museum is for three euros and 50 cents, it's your own green Irish pin. So it's not from Northern Ireland, it's from the Republic, but it should go well because I think we're click and clack here today. Horribly, horribly matched up. <laughs> I know. I feel like that's Laurel. A little, that's a little troublesome. <laughs> this is, you all know Laurel and Hardy, so uh, I think that's us today. But uh, uh, a warm welcome to John Stanton. Looking forward to this, John. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, James. I only have one thank you to the Whaley Museum and the NHA for, for having me here. Um, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of things. These two videos are not in any way, shape, or form films. I know we live in a world where a two-minute video seen on social media is a film. Um, these are not in any way, shape, or form, or, uh, any way, shape, or form a film. They are moments that may someday be a film. Um, the first one you're going to see is an oral history, just a straight-ahead oral history. Uh, in 2009, I had the chance to go over to Belfast to work on a film that was supposed to be about uh, a basketball group that took high school kids from a Protestant high school and kids from a Catholic high school. Now, even in 2009, uh, you know, the world, was, the world in Belfast was segregated between Catholic and Protestant by about 98% in, in things public, in public schools and in um, public housing, particularly. And um, so that, for, for, for many reasons, not the least of which being we couldn't raise any more money when we came back. Um, that film kind of went by the wayside. But, but what people told me when we came back, the reason we couldn't raise any money is we would go to places like the Ireland American Fund and they would say, the war's over. And I became more interested in, when I went back and looked at footage of people we had talked to, I became more interested in what happens with the peace. All right, Belfast right now is at a moment 
when 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement. So this Good Friday will be 20 years that the Good Friday Agreement was signed in Belfast, um, putting an end to the 30 years of, of, of sort of bloody civil war, as, as it were. Um, people still live behind walls. People still live in segregated worlds. But they're at a moment where violent confrontation is giving way to civic confrontation. And that's a huge, huge jump. And to me, that's an exciting moment. So you'll see a little bit of that here. Some of this first one you're going to see was shot in 2009. Some of it was shot just recently. I, have, I was over there, and I had a small grant, and I, and I used it to go over to, to Belfast in this October. So, uh, so that's the first one you're going to see. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk. And hopefully, we'll have time for, for questions. I, I don't want to give a, a, a talk on the history of the Troubles, because I don't want it to seem like I'm an expert at anything other than making films. Um, you know, my, the way I work is to just meet with people and let them have their say. And so lots of that's what you see here. I mean, I don't believe you should go, I believe in a sort of traditional oral history way to go about things. So uh, if I can work this technology, we'll, uh, we'll see it. <laughs> West Belfast in particular can be quite a left, left wing sort of area. You see slogans supporting uh, the Palestinians and, um, and when I grew up there were wall murals and I painted one of them uh, that were making links between the, the ANC in South Africa and the Republicans here, the um, ANC, IRA, One Struggle, these sort of murals. So I wrestled with my own politics. but. Um, uh, and uh, trying to make sense of uh, being a Republican, and I always saw myself as a Republican, but I know if I walk into a room, the first thing people see is a black guy, and even people in this area, or people in Belfast generally, they don't naturally assume uh, he must be a Republican. They just say he's black, wonder where he's from, you know? So um, <clears throat> my life has been one of uh, trying to wrestle with identity. Born in West Belfast, and my my father died during the Troubles and because of what my father did, my mother then became a target to the police and the army. They would kick the door in, come in, knowing that there was no guns there, but that was their excuse saying they were looking for guns because of my father's background. Completely wrecked the house, push the kids around, give my mother a slap on the mouth and leave again and then do it. You know, this was happening every week. I had my first kiss at the back of these houses on that side of the street. And at the back of these houses, I, I, I was up at the top. And um, uh, yeah, the back of this, these houses, I think it was, the IRA were on down at the bottom. And as I was kissing this girl, um, they started shooting at the British Army. It was during the hunger strike, 1981. And, um, uh, so it was very, very scary, it was barricades all around the bottom of the street and the, the IRA were on this side of the barricades, the British Army were on the far side. Unfortunately for me, the girl that I was kissing was from the far side and she asked me to leave her home but I, I brought her as far as the barricade and then left her to run for her life. So um, I, I wasn't too brave at the time and I regret that. I was coming home from the gym one early evening on a Saturday and I took a shortcut through Annadale Flats, which is a staunch Protestant loyalist stronghold. And five guys who knew I was a Catholic beat, they uh, nearly killed me. They really beat the shit out of me. Five of them, and the only way I, could, I thought of them stopping, I nearly got up three times. And the only way I got them to stop was to let on like I was out. So I had to stop protecting my face take open kicks to the face until they realised he's either unconscious or we've killed him. About two or three years ago, I was at the open farm with the kids, you know, where the kids go and pet the animals, and I saw one of the guys who did it, and I got so fired up and paranoid about it. He was on his phone for a second, 
and I thought, who the hell is he ringing? So we had only just arrived, and I insisted that we pack up and go home. I'm sure he was only calling his mother or something, but I had to get out of there. Uh, no, I didn't say I was IRA, no, but I did go, I did go to jail. Um, I was uh, uh, a few streets from here. There was um, weapons, four rifles and grenades and 500 rounds of ammunition and stuff. Uh, and they were found in a car that was on our property and I was the, the only one in the house at the time. And um, there was an informer involved, so he told the British and the RUC, the police, and they came and I was taken away and then taken to Castle Ray. Uh, they arrested uh, members of my family and threatened to arrest more. And so I ended up uh, uh, taking a hit for it and got seven years. Went to the H blocks in 19, I was arrested in 1990. Um, I ended up in the H blocks in 91. And, and then while I was in there, it was a very interesting time. I saw where all the talks had started and um, uh, Sinn Féin were negotiating and the IRA were negotiating with the British. And uh, so I went in, everything was going at full tilt. The, the, the armed struggle, this area was particularly active area and um, when I, by the time I was coming out on my first parole uh, uh, the ceasefire was called, pretty much in the, the same fortnight I got out for the first time. So um, there was this remarkable transformation and, and as prisoners we were all involved in trying to influence how Sinn Féin proceeded and they canvassed our views on a lot of the major decisions that they made. In the next street, which is only 20 yards away, we had a bar where a number of people who are, you know, it's now on the record that were mass murderers and some of them subsequently themselves were murdered, used to drink and we knew who they were, they knew who we were. In terms of the violence itself, the Shankill straddles two parts of Belfast, North Belfast and West Belfast. It sits uh, part of the Shankills in North, part of, part of it's in West. And over the 40 years of violence in Northern Ireland, 65% um, of all the violent incidents and the troubles took place in North and West Belfast, with the Shankill very much at the epicentre of that. So where we're sitting within, um, within 300 square yards of where we're sitting, there were uh, four major bombs went off here over a period of time, which, you know, killed numbers of people on the Shankill just within the small patch that we're sitting on now. If you lived in the Shankill Road as a Protestant, then you took up a certain position in the same in the Falls Road where you, you took a certain position. So people, when people ask me about me or my generation, they believe that we were born into it. If they kill people in our community, then we've done everything to kill people in their community. Basically, in the 70s, we were under attack. We had bombs, car bombs, going off on a regular period. We had people being shot and killed in these communities. And people felt that they had the duty or a right or whatever to retaliate. And a lot of people in the Protestant community seen retaliation or reaction to IRA violence as a, a means of uh, fighting the IRA. And that's why a lot of young, young people, I mean, I had many people, or uh, friends, who were killed during the conflict. Um, I had many friends who went to prison. So, so it, uh, that, I mean... Uh, so how do you fight back against that? I mean, you, you, did you go over to West Belfast and... Oh, yeah, oh, you, you, I mean, it, it was eye for eye. I, I mean, that, that would be the only means of retaliation that we could uh, see. So if they planted a bomb in our communities, then we had done everything to plant a bomb in our community. As a child, uh, when my mother walked me into town, she held my hand. And I, I, I can now actually remember that she used to hold my hand more tightly in some places than in others. This is a completely divided society. A, you know, it's just profoundly divided. Beyond this university area in the centre of town, every street that you walk into is either a Protestant street or a Catholic street. Simple fact of life about Belfast. And there are walls dividing this city. That doesn't mean that there aren't friendships uh, across the divide. There are many friendships across the divide. There were a number of bombings 
in and around this area due to the proximity of the Catholic population here and the law courts and the city centre, of course, which was extensively bombed through the Troubles. It would be difficult to move on and be countrymen, and yet each claims the other as kin. You know, the Republican argues that the Protestant isn't really British, he's Irish, if only we'd waken up to it, you know, you know. So, so in a sense, he, you know, uh, on the one hand saying, yes, you're completely different from me, but I am claiming kinship with you as a fellow Irish person, and I'm trying to get you to wake up to the fact uh, of the reality of that kinship. How do they feel on the other side? The other side, that's a good question too. Would you know? I think there's some. I think there's something similar in the sense of you know, uh, they are saying to me, "You are British," you know, whether you whether you like it or not, uh, you know. But they're also sometimes saying, "And if you don't like it, why don't you just leave?" So that's not actually kinship, you know. Um, we get been a recent argument about whether. Um, Unionists would go into a United Ireland for the sake of their material well-being after Britain has left the European Union. And if, you know, if the British economy crashed, Ireland would still be part of the European Union. Unionists could go in, back into the European Union through United Ireland. And many unionists are saying, but this is absurd because that assumes that we would be motivated by material well-being and that that would mean more to us than our identity means. <laughs> Was it, it's the only country in the world where they remember the future. That's, that's a good way to describe it, is it? <laughs> you like that one? What, so, so tell me what, you, what, what that means. Well, it's, it's, it's just, you know, Northern Ireland, or Ireland in general, you know, if you're great, great, great granda, did something 300 years ago, you carry that legacy about with you, and that stigma about with you for, for another generation, you know, they, they don't forget. It's something that's ingrained, and it's ingrained in terms of one of the, one, and I just emphasise, one of the causes of the violence was the levels of sectarianism here, and those aren't de dealt with by um, new structures of government, they're not dealt with by new laws, they're not dealt with by easily by new situations, they have to be worked on hard and, and that ingrained, in-depth level of sectarianism that exists here is something that has to be dealt with or, or it'll come back to bite us at a, at a future point. The war, was, the war was fought at a street level, it was fought by people within these communities, it was fought by uh, Protestant against Catholic who loved Chikbajal, and it's the same way we will build it, because we are still living here. We're still living together, side by side. So uh, we have to build it together, and that's the way we're doing with the peace. Same tactics, same um, procedures, but it's coming from the ground, it's coming from the people who live in the communities. It doesn't come from the street, it'll never come. It has to come from the street. It has to come from the people who fought the war, not the people who directed it. Peace is actually about the quality of people's lives and about building a new society. And, and actually people talk about building peace. People talk about building peace brick by brick. And there's another image in my mind which goes back to kids playing basketball in the same team, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, and about doing different things together of that nature. And, and it's more about weaving peace, which I think is a better image. It's about people's lives and the uh, people's lives being intricately linked together and when people's lives are intricately linked together at every level whether it's about their sport or whether it's in addition about their jobs and about where they live and about their friendships and about their children coming and growing up together when people's lives are intimately woven together you can't it's much harder to rend that asunder well, I, I have lived my whole life in violence. Right? I've been born and yet seen it over the last 30, 40 years, people getting killed. Right? Now, if I have to wait another 20 years, then that's good, because my son will reap the benefit of that, that, that success. I mean, old saying sometimes, the best, 
you can't build a house on sand. And that's where a lot of, a lot of uh, initiatives fail, is that they build their houses on sand and they collapse. So this process is robust. It has to be robust or it'll just collapse, you know. It could have collapsed a fortnight ago, but it didn't. It could collapse now because, because of the resurgence of individuals, but it's not because it's too robust, because it was spilled on solid rock. Now, if it takes you an extra few weeks or an extra few years to do that, if it takes a few days to do that, then, unfortunately, that's, that, that's what you have to do, because it's better we don't want it in 10 years' time, just going back the way it was. So that's why I would love to see things happen move along quicker, you know. I would love to see things move along like I do on the internet and all, 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 all these techniques. It doesn't work like that. You know, I, for my children, I certainly don't want them to be expending all this mental energy on working out that, you know, there are some people down here who, you know, potentially would want to kill you. There are some people here who would potentially want to chase you and beat you up, that when you get to here, you have to be careful because some people drive this way because they can easily shoot someone here and then drive back and get back to an area. That when you get to here and you're going into town, you need to know that this, these shops are potential targets for bombing. You know, that's just such a waste of, of people's time and energy. When I was very young, you know, it it was the height of the troubles, and it was very uh, dangerous. But I think it's better that that these children grow up um, having a very normal life and not having to worry about helicopters in the air or British Army paratroopers running around the street. I think it's better that they have a very normal life and um, and um, that, that their innocence isn't taken away before, you know, before they're out of primary school. The ceasefires always break down. People, I guess what I'm trying to say, at the end of the day, people still hate each other. You know, I've lived through the whole of the troubles. I've seen what can happen when we have a period of stability and how well we can live together and how quickly we can come back together. But I, I really do think that there's the potential for all that to break apart, just like that. There simply isn't that danger in the air anymore. You know, I mean, there is some danger in the air because there are still paramilitary organisations which are armed and uh, who uh, and which want to uh, to bring back the trouble. Uh, there's certainly, you, I mean, if you just if you live, listen to the local news, this never reaches the national news or the international news. But if you're living in Belfast and you listen to the local news, you will hear accounts of um, people being shot in the legs by paramilitary groups as uh, uh, disciplinary measures or punishments. Uh, you will hear reports of occasional efforts to shoot police officers or put a bomb under their car, you know. These are routine events still in Northern Ireland. I'm not talking about every day, but I am talking about every one or two weeks, you know. And, you know, the policing of these events is pretty good. Uh, the guys who do the shootings in the legs never get caught, okay, that's, but that's a routine thing. Uh, the guys who try the bombs tend to be intercepted, their bombs get intercepted. These organisations must be pretty well infiltrated by intelligence services. But they're there and they're doing it. And uh, who's to know that uh, the bomb that today gets intercepted and wrapped up by the cops and disarmed by the army and is no threat to anybody doesn't go off tomorrow and, and kill ten people or five people. And were that to happen, and we are living on the brink of that happening perpetually. Were that to happen, the entire political context would change very quickly. Does that colour, is there colours every day, everyday life? No, nobody's thinking about it. Nobody is thinking about this, except the journalists who cover the stories, except the police uh, who have to track these people and stop these things happening, except the kids who are getting shot in the legs. You know, but nobody else is thinking about it. This is not part of the public discourse or discussion. Nobody sitting out there having a cup of tea on a summer's day, late summer's day is thinking, oh my God, we, we could be on the brink of a resumption of violence in Northern Ireland. But they're all reading in the newspaper or hearing on the news every second or third week that a bomb has failed to go off 
or that a bomb has been thrown at a house and uh, when often nobody was injured or that um, you know or that uh, you know a kid has been found in a back alley with bullet wounds in his legs I want I want to uh, I guess I don't need a microphone I want to identify and I did not put IDs on anybody um, because I wanted it to feel, I didn't want, I wanted it to feel like we were all taking a walk through Belfast and I was introducing you to some people I know. And I didn't want us to decide who was right or wrong. All right. Um, uh, clearly, West Belfast is a Catholic neighborhood, which starts off there. The Shankill Road is the epicenter of uh, Protestant paramilitarism during the bad old days. Uh, but I do want to identify two people. Um, because one of them, Plum, Plum Smith, who uh, has the striped shirt, he talks, about, he talks about violence a lot, he said he grew up in violence. Um, he was uh, said to be the commander of a thing called the Red Hand Brigade. It was a, uh, it was a, uh, it was a part of the uh, Ulster Volunteer Force, the, the UVF. And um, uh, he became, a, he became a, um, a big advocate for the peace process and uh, worked really uh, diligently at it. When I met him, he was, he was working diligently at, at uh, bringing people together. And um, he had a heart attack last year and, and died, so I was glad to get him on camera. Uh, and the other guy is the last person you see on the screen. His name is Malachi O'Darty, and he's a journalist. And I mention his name because you're going to see him in this next piece. Um, again, I... Um, every once in a while, the Boston Globe comes here. And they do a story about Nantucket, and they get all the facts right, and they get it wrong. And I didn't want to be that same guy in Belfast. So what I started to look for on this trip back was an interesting way to get into the story, an interesting way to, because I think a documentary film has two jobs. And the first is, any documentary film, I think, the first is to set you down and let you walk around in somebody else's world for a little bit. Um, and the, the, the second is to, um, I forget what the second one was, no. but the second is to, uh, is to, um, maybe there's only one, maybe it's only to let you, let you sit in that world, but, uh, uh, we want to get to the end of a question, but I don't want to be the guy who pretends like the Boston Globe sometimes does. There's a, there's a Graham Greene book called The, uh, called the Quiet American, and in it he writes, it's about Vietnam, and early days of Vietnam, and in it he writes that um, a, a journalist could go to Vietnam and get his newspaper story in a week, and he could get his, write his book in six months, and in a year he would finally know that he didn't know anything. Um, so I had, I, had, I had an opportunity to, have, uh, to drive outside of Belfast to a place called Inniskillen, and have a, no, uh, yeah, I guess it was the name of the place, and have a um, uh, lunch with a uh, uh, sort of a journalist slash teaches at Trinity, but he lives in the north. And he told me a story about teaching at um, the maze. At the time, it was called Long Cash. It was the prison. Um, and teaching both IRA prisoners and Protestant paramilitary prisoners. And, how, and he taught, you know, he's a writer, so he taught writing and literature. And uh, Sinn Féin had told all the IRA guys that when they got out, they were going to be journalists, TV, TV reporters, uh, poets, you know, in that Irish tradition. They were going to influence, they were going to be like soft power. They were no longer going to use a gun. They were going to influence people. Um, the loyal, he said the loyalist uh, prisoners mostly wanted to learn how to be plumbers when they were there. But they found out that the IRA guys were getting something, and they wanted it too. So in the morning, he would teach a group of IRA prisoners. And in the afternoon, he'd teach a group of Protestant paramount loyalist prisoners. And uh, one of those loyalist prisoners became a, a playwright. And you know, we talked about him that afternoon. And, and I thought, well, maybe the arts is an interesting way to get into it. So this next film is sort of a look at how, through poetry, how the troubles um, Sort of left their mark on people. 
if, if you go over to Belfast and you speak, and it's, a, and it's a great city, it's really enjoyable to be there. Um, the people couldn't be warmer. Um, but everybody you meet, if you start to talk to them, it will take you a few times to have drinks with them before they actually tell you this, but everyone's story has a bullet or a dead person in it or a bomb. Um, and so these poems start with that as well. It is both a dignity and a difficulty to live between these names, perceiving politics in the syntax of the state. And at the end of the day, the reality is that whether we change or whether we stay the same, these questions will remain. Who are we to be with one another? And how are we to be with one another? And what to do with all those memories of all those funerals? And what about those present whose past was blasted far beyond their future? You know, we were living at a time of, of extreme violence. We were living at a time of political upheaval, you know? So there, you know, you do expect writers to notice that, <laughs> don't you, you know? So uh, you don't expect them to take, um, to follow political agendas. You don't expect them to contort their opinions to, uh, uh, to represent a viewpoint that they don't hold. But you do expect them to notice the fact that um, uh, people are being killed on the street that it's not safe to walk the streets at night, that pubs are being bombed, that people are being arrested in their homes by soldiers and, and taken away and interrogated, uh, and that bodies are being found on the border with, with little or no explanation of, of who they are or why. Rum and raisin, vanilla, butterscotch, walnut, peach. You would rhyme off the flavours. That was before they murdered the ice cream man on the Lisburn Road and you bought carnations to lay outside his shop. I named for you all the wildflowers of the burren I had seen in one day. My friend George was uh, a businessman. I didn't know him at the time. I, I've befriended him since. Uh, he opened a little ice cream shop in South Belfast, and his brother was a member of the police force, the RUC, and George was going off on holiday for a week uh, in Spain, and his brother was on leave, so it was a good enough arrangement. The brother would mind the shop and serve ice cream, right? And one of the people who was a regular in the shop was the daughter of, of the great poet, Michael Longley, right? And, uh, and a, a ritual that they had, if you like, was going into the shop and her reciting the names of the different ice creams that she loved. Okay, so that's the backdrop to the story and the poem. John Larmer is minding the shop one evening. There are the teenage lovers at a little table by the door when two men come in and uh, they ask for chocolate ice cream or something. And while John's back is turned, one of the men draws a gun and shoots him. And the other at the door turns his gun on the two teenagers at the table and shoots them. John is killed, right? The two teenagers, the lovers are, are wounded. The men leave the shop, right? Now, George hears about this on holiday. George has to come home, and, uh, and he has written at great length about the trauma within his family, the grief, the need to try and understand, the need to get some kind of cooperation with the police in investigating this. Michael Longley, you know, isn't trying to get to the heart of who killed this man, but he writes a poem in tribute. He takes his daughter's recitation of the names of her favourite ice creams, and, and he... Uh, mixes it with a recitation of uh, a list of the flowers of the Burren, that is the wild flowers of, of the west of Ireland. And it's just a very tranquil, soft, gentle poem. Um, it doesn't rhyme, it, you know, it doesn't have a punchline, it absolutely doesn't have a punchline. And in a sense, it's, you, know, you would not expect somebody like George, uh, who's a working class man, brilliant man, but not, uh, you know, uh, uh, with any great interest in poetry and with not uh, any awareness of the, of the different strands of poetry. He wouldn't know the difference between imagism and the limerick if you, you know, if one of them bit him. But, uh, but to my surprise and to Longley's, this poem meant an awful lot to them. And he wrote to Longley and he said, you know, my mother, you, you sent that poem to my mother and uh, she did like it. She, she, she was very, very touched, not just by the fact that the great man, Michael Longley, 
thinks about her, her son who's been killed. But, but she actually loved the poem, and George loves the poem. And, and uh, you know, I've been with, uh, with George when he's met Michael Longley, and, and Michael is clearly very, very touched by this himself. Gil McConnell's father was the governor of the Mays Prison. The Mays Prison had been the scene of uh, the hunger strikes. And, um, you know, as a child, she lived with a father who had to check under his car in the morning to see if there was a bomb under it, look after their own security. And uh, her father was, was murdered by the IRA. Now, she, was, she was just a small child at the, the time that happened. Uh, she has written this long form poem pegged to the idea of the fonts and newspaper accounts and so on, but drawing out her whole questioning about that experience and uh, her own uh, ability or inability to reconcile herself to this, you know. And what is striking about it for me is that, that I knew Gail before I knew the story. You know, I didn't know that her father had been murdered, you know, until I read the poem, you know. She never told me. Now, we weren't great close friends, but we had met and talked on many occasions, you know, in, a, in an informal way around the university and so on. And, uh, and what the poem says to me, essentially, is that there are so many people here who are carrying this with them, you know, who've had somebody close to them killed, who've been wounded by the whole experience of the Troubles, right? And who have not been, you know, uh, talking much about it, if at all, you know. We do have... Um, there are people who routinely, if you like, represent victims' issues, people who are, are marvellous people that, you know, have the courage to come out and talk about their experience and, uh, and so on. But if you just look at the figures, the numbers of dead running into 3,500, the numbers of people in a victim's forum, maybe half a dozen to a dozen, the, you know, there must be tens of thousands of people out there who are close relatives of somebody who was shot dead, killed in a bomb, um, died in a hunger strike or, um, uh, you know, or just had a heart attack at the scene of a bomb and never even got listed as one of the dead, you know, there must be tens of thousands of people out there who are affected by that. And what Gail's poem kind of reminds me, the way it works in me, is to remind me that, that even the most, even somebody you know might be living with this story and have difficulty with that story. I wake, you wake, she wakes. He wakes, they wake, we wake, and take this troubled beauty forward. I remember what that second thing was now. And this is why I never did very well academically, because I always thought of the answer, you know, when I was walking away from the test. Um, and it is that there's an old saying that a documentary film only really begins when the house lights come back up and people can talk about it. So hopefully we can talk, talk about it. And um, although I hate to go first in anything, I will go first. I'll tell you a story that was told to me, but I couldn't, in the days I was there, I couldn't get a hold of the people involved. So there was a young Ulster Volunteer Force soldier um, named Robert Niblock, who on behest of his commanders in the 70s, followed uh, a suspected informant down an alleyway and slit his throat. When the British Army pulled him over, or the RUC, the local cops, uh, he had a trunk full of plastic explosives and that did not help his case and he went to the Mays prison on a life sentence. Where he where he took these classes that, 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 that the first guy was telling me about earlier. Um, and when he, when he was released as part of the Good Friday Agreement, political prisoners got released, um, he became a playwright. And he wrote about loyalist working class neighborhoods. Now, as you walk around Belfast, there is a giant difference. You can easily tell whether you're in a, what was called a Republican. So everyone says Catholic and Protestant. Uh, to me, I feel like it was actually, what, it, what the difference is, is very simple. It's people who want to be part of the Republic of Ireland, they're called Republicans, or nationalists, and it's people who want to stay loyal to the crown, who are called unionists or loyalists. 
Now, some level is a distinction between unionists and loyalists, which I'm not really clear on. But in these loyalist neighborhoods, uh, they're hard scrabble, and people do not want to talk to you. They don't want to tell their stories because they don't, they're not part of that Irish tradition of storytelling, right? Of, you know, a hundred years of, or a thousand years of putting their uh, wars on the stages and in pages of poetry. So that interested me more, but the loyalist part, because, you know, when people are trying hard to do something, that's always more interesting. So Robert Niblock wrote a play about loyalist, his neighborhood he grew up in, about paramilitaries. It was, it was uh, well received in Belfast. Didn't go much outside of Northern Ireland. He made a theater company. He tries to get loyalist people to tell their stories. There's another playwright, also uh, Protestant, who grew up in a, in a, in a loyalist state, um, high scrabble working class estate. He was not in the paramilitaries. He just grew up there and he became a playwright. His name is uh, Gary Mitchell. Well, Gary Mitchell also wrote a play about the loyalist lifestyle. It was called uh, As the Beast Sleeps. He wrote it around the Good Friday Agreement. His idea was that everybody's happy and signing the papers downtown. Meanwhile, in these neighborhoods, the beast is only sleeping. And um, it opened in Dublin. It opened in London. London Times called him the authentic voice of working class Belfast. Paramilitaries responded by petrol bombing his car and then knocking on his door and announcing that everybody whose last name was Mitchell, not only him, but everybody whose last name was Mitchell, had four hours to get out of the housing complex or they were to come back and murder him. So he took them for his, at their word because he knew some of these guys. And he, uh, and he went into hiding for three years. We didn't write another word for three years. He, he, he's still a playwright. He's sort of gotten past that. Um, but they, they allowed his grandmother to stay in the, he said, everyone has to leave, but your Grammy can stay. We, we know her. She's fine. And when she died two years later, he, he called a friend of his who was involved in the paramilitaries and asked him, if, go ask your bosses if I can come back for my grandmother's funeral. And they said no. And he said, well, I'm doing it anyways. And he went in with a giant police presence, went to the, and even the police said, you go to funeral and get right back in the car, and we're getting out of here. So to me, those are interesting ways to get at a historical moment, which you don't have to be an expert. You just have to know those people and tell their stories. So uh, any, any questions? John, what are you sensing? Well, yeah, I went there, you know, I went there with the idea that I had a real one simple idea um, that 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, people still live behind walls. In fact, there's still walls all over the place. People live behind them. Um, and so why is that? The war is over. The new gen young generation of people, if you're in your 20s, you've never seen a British soldier on the street. Um, but the more I talked to regular folk on the street, and I had a chance, I talked to some people who were not regular folk, uh, you know, politicians. But I met a woman, I had a chance to have breakfast with a woman named Monica McWilliams. She has a fascinating story, and she started the, something called the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. And she wrote the, um, she wrote the uh, human rights part of the Good Friday Agreement which was a difficult thing to, after a long story of her telling me how difficult it was to get done, I asked how difficult it was to implement it. And she said, oh no, it's sitting on a shelf in 10 Downing Street. It's never going to be implemented. Um, but talking to her and people like that, you know, their big fear is Brexit. They, un, they think that they're at this point now that they can solve their problems with their neighbors, that the, the sectarian problems can be put aside as people set aside you know, set us, you know, they used to say the Amalite or the ballot. So people have set aside the Amalite, the rifle. And now they're, now civic engagement is what they're lear learning. And it's a process. Right? You have to learn how to do it. I mean, we take it for granted here. Um, and they're, and they're, she felt they were well on their way to learning that. that but everyone's horrified of Brexit. She, 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 ha also said that, she also said that if they put a hard border between the north and the south, 
and then they put a couple of customs officers there, and then the British Army decides they need to put a couple of soldiers there to protect the, the customs officers, then the bad old days might be soon to follow. Um, because there are, I mean, the paramilitaries are still there, they're still armed. Um, you know, you don't hear about them anymore, but there's a, when we were there in 2009, a group calling itself the, uh, continue, the Continuity IRA, um, who didn't believe in the peace process, right? Uh, and who really had no association to the what's called the Provisional IRA uh, and that leadership. They, they, had, they, killed a, they killed a police officer. You know, they called him up and they called up the station and they said, there's a, there's a problem going on here. When he showed up in his cruiser, they, they had a guy, in a, you know, a sniper and they, they killed him. Um, they, and later, the week before, right before we got there, they, a bomb was thrown into an army barracks and, and killed two soldiers. Now, that you don't see that much. Like I said, if you read the Belfast Telegraph, you will see that occasionally. They don't really connect it to anything. There's been a rise in paramilitary punishment shootings, but that just be, you know, that is because in some cases politics is being replaced with just being a mob. You know, we're done doing politics, we'll just be the mafia now. Um, but people are, people are very optimistic. Like, like, uh, like Malachi O'Darty says um, in that piece, people don't talk about it, people don't think about it. People just are happy to move on and you know, I think they're at that moment. What, what I find interesting, and sa sadly, it often takes two or three years to raise the money to do one of these films. And so uh, who, knows if I, who knows how things will, will have changed by the time I ever get back there, if I ever do. Um, it's that moment that I find interesting, that, that, that balance between optimism and still worrying about a little bit about, um, you know, the bad old days returning but moving forward and leaving the violent engagement for the civic engagement, so. Talking about that, I thought Dave Collins' story was interesting. If you could maybe fill people in on that, on what the guy who talked about getting... Oh, sure. Yeah, I know. I know who Dave is. Um, uh, Dave is a... Uh, Dave Cullen, who's the guy you see... He's kind of, he's, he's, he's kind of, he looks kind of run down. He's the, so he, his first was the black guy, and then it was Dave, the West Belfast, to two guys who grew up in West Belfast, right? And Dave is the guy whose father got killed. Uh, British soldiers would come and knock on the door and rip up the floorboards, um, and then he was beat up. Um, he, I like that, I don't like it, I don't like that it happened to him, but that story where he gets beat up, and then he, um, and then he, uh, that was a long time ago. Now he's 60, and he, he still, that moment where he took his kids to the farm and that was still in him, is like, is like to me it was like the echoes of, of a war that, you, that it's hard to shake. We took him by Annandale Flats, and, and he, we were going to shoot an interview there, but he didn't want to get out of the car, so. I said, and, he, and he told us that the, the three of those, the three of the four guys that beat him up later on got killed by the IRA, you know, right before the peace agreement, um, and what he felt was housekeeping whatever that means. Um, but Dave ran a project called Full Court Peace. And um, it, it was a project we were originally going to do a story on. And it takes, it took four kids from, it took, it took six, right? Bas 12 guys on a basketball team. It took six kids from a school called St. Joseph's, right? A Catholic school. And then six kids from a school called Orange Fields. And it brought them together. Um, it taught them basketball separately until, as Dave would say, until one of the kids said, hey, coach, are there only six guys on a basketball team? And then let's go meet your teammates. Um, and the idea was that just the ethos of team play, of, of being on a team with other, with other people would help them take baby steps across that. Uh, Dave won the, um, the ESPY award uh, the year before I met him for, for that kind of work that he was doing. Um, uh, nah, that, that program, the story of my life and everybody I know, apparently, um, is he lost funding for that program. And so he, uh, he, now, he now works in a boxing gym. He play, had played professional basketball. I said, Dave, did you box? He goes, I opened a door and I close it at night. Uh, he's not teaching boxing. But, um, but he's, a, he's, he's the kind of people that, you, that are still affected by this, you know, who can't shake those moments that they lived through.
you know, I don't know. Um, I've only been to Belfast. Uh, Ten minutes outside Belfast. It's beautiful rolling hills, and it looks like I made a mistake of saying to, uh, to, to, to uh, my driver when I went out to do an interview about an hour outside of Belfast, boy, this looks like Ireland out here. And he said, it looks like the north of England, son. So, uh, um, and I mean, it's beautiful, and people have gone to university. And I mean, all of these people who are just, the, the, all of these people live in a hard scrabble. They live in those hard places where all the killing and dying happened. Um, so, so, and they'll all say, Look, you know, all of them, I mean, even the politicians. You know, Monica McWilliams, her story begins as a 19-year-old. She was from a Catholic area, Republican area, grew up there. As a 19-year-old college sophomore at Queens University, her boyfriend was in, a, was in a pub, coming home from a pub drunk on a Friday night, as one does, and uh, a couple of guys in a car pulled him off the street, and... Uh, because they thought he looked like an IRA bomb maker they were looking for. Um, they tortured him for two days, and then they put a bullet in his head and dropped him off in the soccer field, at, in the playing fields at uh, Queens. So her story begins that way, too. I mean, it's in, and they stay with. She actually left and finished up her degree at University of Michigan and then went back um, and worked in domestic violence when she went back, which, which it was an unfortunate, you know, uh, giant amount, and as she said, there was so much violence on the street, nobody was talking about violence in the house. Um, but I think that everybody will say to you that five minutes outside Belfast in the countryside, um, people don't really care. People have been to university, people have professional jobs. I mean, Dave, Dave's married to a, to a Protestant woman, and I asked him that, Dave Cullen, and I asked him that, and he said, oh, you know, I, I, I slept with her before I knew she was Protestant. Then I was hooked. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's the answer. But, I mean, is that when you, when you lead a regular life with people, um, the guy who has kind of a sweater like me on and a white hair and who's talking about not brick by brick, but to him the metaphor is interwoven, um, his name is um, Jackie Redpath. And Jackie is a community leader. As he said the first time I met him, just like Obama a community leader in the Shankill area, um, uh, who was proud to say he never picked up a gun and that he'd been to IIRA funerals and both sides accepted you know, who he was. But, um, you know, he's right. When you live, every part of your life is, is interwoven and you're dependent on, without thinking about it, on the people on the other side of the wall, then the wall might as well not be there. So. That's kind of what you get, I think. I think again, I haven't been out there. You get to Derry, and it's just like Belfast. So, I mean, it's one of the, again, it's the places where where the bad stuff happened. You know, that I mean. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Is that it? Well, thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks to Novation Media, and uh, thanks to uh, MS Worthington Foundation, and most of all, John. That was just brilliant. You always remember the right people to thank. I forget that, too. <laughs> uh, thank you all, and we're uh, on again uh, tomorrow uh, with Charity Grace up at the African, uh, African Meeting House, right? right? Okay, we'll see everybody there. Great. Thank you.